the volcanic tundra, a land of thermal contradictions, where blistering heat meets the crushing cold. Here, a solitary jinx endures the blizzard. She is not wandering aimlessly. She is on a specific quest. Her thick dermal layer protects her from the frost, but her focus today is purely cosmetic. She is being watched, a sneasel, a sharp-clawed opportunist of the frozen wastes. Sensing her distraction, the predator coils its muscles, calculating the distance. One mistake is all it needs. But Jinx is faster. Her psychic receptors trigger a violent defensive discharge before he can make contact. Paralysis is instant. The Sneasel's hunt ends before it truly began. Unbothered by the violence, she returns to her reflection. Her skin is dry. To her, this is unacceptable. A geothermal vent, the perfect source for the mineral-rich sulfur she craves. But these vents are not unclaimed territory. Something ancient stirs beneath the crust. A magma, a biological furnace. His body temperature alone is enough to ignite the oxygen around him. Ice meets fire in a territorial dispute. She erects a psychic barrier against his thermal assault, a desperate defense against 2,000 degrees. The sublimation creates a blinding fog. In the chaos, Jinx vanishes from sight. But she hasn't fled. She uses the lovely kiss, a potent neurotoxin. It works instantly. She attacks him. Assuming he's neutralized, she turns her back. She underestimated his resilience. Magma recover conscious and strikes her with fire blast. A direct hit. She resorts to her most primal instinct, sobbing. The magma hesitates. The acoustic frequency of her cry dampens his aggression. He is confused. A fatal error. The fake tear's strategy lowers his guard completely. Shadow ball, a condensed sphere of spectral energy. It pierces through flesh and bone, killing magma instantly. With the rival eliminated, the spa day continues. For the Jinx, beauty. In the deep forest, some creatures survive not through vigilance, but through trust in their own strength. This one sleeps without fear, massive, undisturbed, unaware that in nature, size does not mean safety. Not all hunters rely on teeth or claws. Some wait, some watch, and some feed where resistance cannot exist. Dreams are not safe places, they are doors. When a mind is emptied, something else takes its place. Inside them, instinct takes over. The mind runs even when the body cannot. And slowly, the self gives way. What emerges is not new. It has always been there, watching, learning, waiting for the moment to cross over. Nothing remains once it has fed. It continues elsewhere. Some creatures believe they can protect themselves by pretending, by building walls that do not exist. But fear doesn't respect illusion.
In the dense, ancient forests of Kanto, survival is not about strength, it is about performance. Meet Mime Junior, a creature that exists between reality and illusion. To the untrained eye, these movements look like play. But this is not a dance, it is a drill. Mimicry is its only shield against a world that wants to eat it. The mimicry serves a physiological purpose by vibrating its fingertips at hypersonic frequencies. It agitates the air molecules around it. It compresses oxygen and nitrogen until they lock into a solid lattice. An invisible wall, harder than steel. To the naked eye, it is nothing. But seen through thermal imaging, it is a fortress. But Mime Jr.'s walls are fragile, incomplete. The Murkrow, an opportunistic scavenger, detects the psychic weakness. It strikes. Speed is the enemy of the Mimic. Mime Jr. has nowhere to run. Panic floods its nervous system. To survive the talons, it must stop mimicking and start manifesting. The air hardens. The evolution begins. Panic is gone, replaced by a cold, calculating calm. When the predator returns for a second pass, it doesn't find a victim. The air around Mr. Mime doesn't just vibrate anymore, it solidifies. It finds a dead end. In the wild, strength is usually measured in claws and teeth. But here, the strongest weapon is the mind. Mr. Mime doesn't need to hunt. He simply dictates reality. And in his reality, Silence usually means peace, but here, forgotten rituals have weakened the veil. The ancient barriers are broken. Through this breach, a malevolent consciousness forced its way in. Its manifestation is incomplete. It requires more energy. A small, unsuspecting life. To the entity, this isn't a creature. It is a catalyst, a weak spark, but enough to begin the stabilization process. In a flash of light, Caterpie is consumed to fuel the ascension. The surge triggers a violent evolution. From the mist, a haunter is born. A dark energy spike triggers the alarm. Scizor arrives to neutralize the threat. He identifies the intruder and strikes, but steel cannot cut a shadow. The enemy is untouchable. The entity counters with a confusing ray. The mind shatters. Even a guardian is defenseless against chaos. Scizor falls. Instead of purging the darkness, his immense power will now fuel it. The consumption is complete. The haunter fades. But the real nightmare is just beginning. The night is charged. Something stirs beneath the stormlight. Abra sleeps lightly, guarding its mind even in dreams. From behind the tree, Gengar waits silently, drawn to the faint pulse of psychic energy. Gengar prepares his spectral lick, but Abra teleports instinctively, even while sleeping. Its psychic field quivers, struggling to regain internal balance. Psychic pressure climbs, forcing Abra's organism toward transformation. Light engulfs the body as neural pathways restructure. From the surge, Kadabra emerges renewed. Its mind sharpens. 
Gravity yields to its awakening power. But the rising energy draws attention. In time, Gengar returns to feed on it. Kadabra detects Gengar. Its aura tightens, drawing power from the charged night air. A psychic pulse erupts, scattering the ghost's unstable form and disrupting its cohesion. The psychic load peaks. Deep inside, a new phase of evolution violently awakens. Alakazam emerges, its intellect widened, its mind honed into extraordinary precision. The clash becomes inevitable. Ordered thought slams against spectral entropy in a focused beam. The surge peaks, and reality folds into an abrupt, blinding flash. When the light settles, a wisp of violet vapor lingers, its fate unknown. It isn't obvious at first. It doesn't demand attention. By the time it can be measured, it is too late. This is Paris. What leaves the mushroom is not an attack. It is a release. The body moves, but it does not react. It walks, not by decision, but by continuation. The connection is already in place between the body and what grows on it. There is no visible pain, no clear response. When contact happens, nothing feels intentional. Another body falls. Paras watches, unable to process the outcome. The eyes still receive information, but they no longer know what to do with it. Movement continues. Control does not. The contamination does not spread like an outbreak. It settles as a pattern. Growth does not ask permission. It occupies. Where there was choice, there is repetition. Where there was caution, there is only movement. The body enters the water. It does not hesitate. It does not correct. The powder spreads again over the forest around it. At this point, Paris is no longer sufficient. What remains standing now does not need to move much. The roots do the rest. Some sleep, some do not wake. The entire forest responds the same way. This is no longer an organism. It is an environmental condition. 